Table of content. In the reactor core, uranium fuel rods produced a self-sustaining fission reaction that could create up to 3200 megawatts of thermal energy. Heat in the core turned water from the cooling system to steam, which powered the turbines. An unusual accumulation of steam around the fuel rods could quickly increase the nuclear reaction to dangerously high levels. Clusters of control rods were lowered into the core to slow the reaction, or raised to increase it. These rods had tips made of graphite, which caused the reaction to increase slightly as they entered the core. Graphite blocks placed between the fuel rods were also used to moderate the nuclear reaction. At midnight on April 26, 1986, the number 4 reactor was scheduled for a partial shutdown. The operators were to test whether the turbines would continue to produce enough electricity to run the cooling pumps and other emergency systems in the event of a loss of the main power supply. The less experienced night shift was unaware that the design of the reactor made it unstable and difficult to control below 700 megawatts. They started the test by slowly reducing power to about 500 megawatts using an automatic system to lower control rods into the reactor. Due to an operator mistake or a failure of the automatic system, the power level suddenly dropped to around 30 megawatts, making it difficult to sustain the fission reaction. Startled by the loss in power, the operators violated safety procedures and removed nearly all of the control rods to restore power. Reactor power appeared to slowly increase to 200 megawatts. At the same time, the instability of the reactor forced the operators to take manual control of the cooling system and to shut down a number of automatic warning systems in order to continue the test. The operators did not know that steam was starting to form in the lower part of the core, making the reactor even harder to control. Returning to the test procedure, the operator shut down steam to the single operating turbine generator. As the generator slowed, so did the cooling pumps. Inside the core, a buildup of steam was rapidly increasing the fission reaction. This generated yet more steam, which in turn generated more power. The reaction was now out of control. Following an emergency shutdown procedure, the operators began lowering all the control rods into the reactor to stop the nuclear reaction. But as the rods were lowered, the graphite tips briefly increased the reaction and intensified it at the bottom of the core. Power instantly rose to 100 times the level for which the reactor was designed. The intense heat began to break up the fuel rods at the bottom of the core. Exactly what happened next is not clear, but there were two recorded explosions. Probably a steam explosion first blew off the lid of the reactor. Air entering the reactor mixed with hydrogen from the superheated steam and vapor from the overheated graphite blocks to create a second, bigger explosion. The graphite blocks also caught fire and the smoke sent radioactive particles from the damaged reactor into the atmosphere. What was left of the core continued to heat, melting the lower parts of the building into a lava-like substance. The fires took about two weeks to put out. A concrete containment building called the sarcophagus was constructed over the reactor site to prevent additional radioactive materials from escaping. Serious questions still remain, not only about the containment of the radioactive debris, but about the safety of the remaining 3,000 reactors on the site. Where does color come from? Color depends upon both the characteristics of light and the function of our eye. White light is composed of many different colors, the colors of the rainbow. Each color in the spectrum corresponds to a different wavelength of light. These colors include red, 
orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. We are able to see colors because our eye contains three different color receptors, red, green, and blue. When these receptors are stimulated, our eye can perceive all colors. When color receptors are stimulated in pairs, we perceive yellow, cyan, and magenta. Other colors, such as orange, gray, and brown, result when some of the receptors are only partially stimulated. When colors result from combining lights of different wavelengths, the process is known as additive color mixing. Colors from pigments involve subtractive color mixing. When white light falls upon a colored surface, some wavelengths are absorbed and others are reflected. We interpret the color of the surface according to which wavelengths of light remain. This process is called color subtraction because the color we see depends upon which wavelengths have been subtracted from the A compact disc, or CD, is a plastic disc containing a thin metallic layer that's used for storing large amounts of information. The most popular use for CDs today is for recording and playing back high-quality sound. A high-precision laser beam is used to burn microscopic pits in the thin metal layer of a master disc. The pits are laid down in patterns that can be read by a compact disc player. Thousands of CDs can be made from a single master disc. A CD player contains a low-power laser and high-precision lenses and mirrors. A servo motor positions the optical elements to attract elements to a track on the disc. The laser directs a narrow beam of light onto tracks of the spinning compact disc. Along a track, regions with pits scatter the light differently from regions without pits. The sequence of regions represents the sound information. A photodetector picks up light scattered from the pits and sends a signal to a microprocessor, which converts the signal to sound. The same technology that is used for sound can be used for storing other kinds of digital information as well, including computer programs, pictures, and animations. When used for multiple purposes, the discs are often called CD-ROM, or Compact Disc Read-Only Memory. Along most ocean coastlines, there are two high tides and two low tides a day. The Earth's tides are caused by the gravitational pull of both the Moon and the Sun. The Moon has more influence than the Sun because it is closer to the Earth. As the Earth rotates, the Moon's pull causes its water to bulge. High tides are caused by the moon's pull on the side of the earth closest to it and its lack of pull on the side that is farthest away. Low tides are the areas in between. As the moon rotates around the earth, the tidal bulge follows it. This is why high and low tides occur about an hour later every day. When the sun and the moon are lined up with the earth, their combined pull on the earth's oceans is at its greatest resulting in the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. This happens during full and new moons, and even though it occurs year-round, it is called a spring tide. When the sun and moon are at right angles to each other, their pulls on the Earth's oceans partially cancel each other out. At this point, tides are at the most medium state. This is called a neap tide, and it happens during the first and third quarter phases of the moon.
And those are the ins and outs of the tide. Sound is made up of alternating regions of compressed and rarefied air that travel as a wave. The Doppler effect describes how the frequency or pitch of a sound changes when the source of sound moves toward or away from an observer. The pitch of a sound depends on how frequently wave fronts reach our ears. When the source of sound is moving toward us, wave fronts are more closely spaced and reach our ears more rapidly. We hear a higher pitch sound. When the source is moving away, fewer wave fronts reach our ears each second, resulting in a lower pitch sound. If the speed of the source is greater, there is a more dramatic change in pitch from high to low. When an airplane flies faster than the speed of sound, wave fronts bunch together, producing a shock wave which we hear as a sonic boom. The human ear consists of outer, middle, and inner parts. The outer ear includes the auricle and the auditory canal. The eardrum, or tympanic membrane, marks the boundary between the outer ear and the middle ear. The middle ear contains three small bones connecting the eardrum to the inner ear. They are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The inner ear contains the cochlea, which houses the sound analyzing cells. These cells are connected to the brain through the auditory nerve. Sound waves enter the ear, causing changes in air pressure in the auditory canal. The eardrum vibrates, and the waves are amplified and transmitted by the middle ear to a membrane in the wall of the cochlea. Fluid in the cochlea is set in motion. The vibrations are detected by nerve fibers, and these fibers transmit signals to the brain through the auditory nerve. The nerve fibers are frequency sensitive. Fibers at the deepest part of the cochlea detect the lowest frequencies, and fibers at the other end of the cochlea detect the highest frequencies. The motion we feel on the surface of the earth during an earthquake comes from energy released deep within the earth. This energy is transmitted to the surface by earthquake waves. The study of earthquakes and earthquake waves is called seismology. Earthquakes occur when rocks deep underground suddenly break under pressure or slip along a fault. The point of release is known as the focus of the earthquake. The energy released by the earthquake radiates from the rupturing fault as body waves. There are two types of body waves. The fastest wave is called a P wave, or primary wave. It moves between 4 and 7 kilometers per second, depending on the density of the rock it's moving through. A P wave is a compression type wave. Rocky material in its direction of travel compresses, then expands as the wave passes. A P wave is similar to a wave traveling through a spring. The coils compress and expand in the direction the wave is traveling. The second type of body wave is called an S wave, or secondary wave. It travels at about 2 to 5 kilometers per second through rock, about half the speed of a P wave. An S wave is a transverse shear wave. Rocky material in its path moves up and down or side to side perpendicular to the direction of the wave's travel. An S-wave is similar to a wave traveling along a piece of rope. 
The wave moves along the rope by moving a section of the rope up, then down. Surface waves radiate outward from the epicenter, the point on the surface closest to the focus. Surface waves are slower than body waves, traveling at 2 to 3 kilometers per second. They can change the surface of the Earth as well as damage homes, buildings, and other structures. There are two types of surface waves. A love wave causes side-to-side -side motion perpendicular to its direction of travel. It can cause damage by breaking roads and pipes. The second type of surface wave is called a Raleigh wave. It moves the surface of the Earth up, forward, down, and back in a circle. It can cause damage by knocking buildings off their foundations. In most earthquakes, Combinations of Love and Raleigh waves cause the most destruction because the ground shakes up and down and side to side at the same time. The moon revolves around the Earth in a plane that is inclined slightly to the Earth's orbit. Eclipses occur when Earth, Moon, and Sun are aligned just right. When the Moon is between the Earth and the Sun, its dark side faces us. We call this a new Moon. Most months, the Moon does not block the Sun's light. When the new Moon occurs close to the Sun, the Sun's light is partially obscured. Under these circumstances, we see a partial solar eclipse. On rare occasions, the moon moves directly between the sun and the earth, blocking sunlight from reaching the earth. For a few moments, people standing at certain places on the earth can see a total solar eclipse. When the moon is on the opposite side of the earth from the sun, we see a full moon. At certain times, the moon passes directly through the center of the Earth's shadow, or umbra. Then the full moon appears dark. This is called a total eclipse of the moon. When the moon just grazes the Earth's shadow, passing within the penumbra, we see the full moon darkened slightly. This is a partial lunar eclipse. Since the moon is usually not directly in line with the sun and the earth, the earth's shadow rarely falls on the moon. An electric generator converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. An AC generator produces alternating current that keeps reversing its direction of flow. An armature, consisting of coils of wire wrapped around an iron core, is rotated in a static magnetic field. The movement of the coil through the field causes an electric current to flow in the wires. The wires are connected to slip rings. Brushes contact the slip rings and carry the electricity from the generator. When wires in the coil cut through the magnetic field between the poles of the magnet, current is induced in the wire. When the coil is turning in the direction shown, current flows toward the right in the far side of the coil and toward the left in the near side. The current flows through the wire in one direction during one half of the turn. As it does so, the current changes from zero to maximum flow, then back to zero. During the other half of the turn, the current flows in the opposite direction, since the wires are moving through the field in the opposite way. This changing of direction during each cycle is why this type of current is called alternating current.
An electric motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. A DC motor uses direct current electricity that flows continuously in only one direction around a circuit. A DC motor consists of an armature that rotates within a magnetic field. The armature has a coil of wire wrapped around an iron core. A source of electricity is connected to brushes, which make contact with the commutator on the armature. The commutator is a kind of switch that changes the direction of current flow in the coil as it turns. The electric current flows from the source to the motor and back to the source in one direction. The current carrying wires in the coil experience forces in the presence of the magnetic field. When current is flowing through the coil in the direction shown, the segment of wire near the south magnetic pole is pushed downward by the magnet. The segment near the north magnetic pole is pushed upward. In this way, the magnet causes the armature to turn. After each half turn, the commutator reverses the current. Forces on the coil reverse and the turn is complete. The cycle repeats making the movement continuous. Devices attached to the rotating armature shaft, such as pulleys and gears, can be used to perform any number of useful tasks. The effects of electricity can be seen in everything from thunderstorms to television sets. Benjamin Franklin was the first to establish that lightning was actually a gigantic electric spark. He flew a kite during a thunderstorm. When lightning struck the kite, an electrical spark jumped from the string to the ground. In a thundercloud, strong air currents cause electrical charges to separate from one another. Positive charges are driven toward the top of the cloud, and negative charges accumulate at the bottom. The negative charges, or ions at the base of the cloud, attract positive ions to regions on the ground, beneath the cloud. When the amount of charge becomes large enough, a spark begins to form. In a fraction of a second, a tremendous amount of electricity flows through the air, which heats it to incandescence, forming a lightning bolt. In a flashlight, electrical charges are separated by chemical reactions within a battery. Negative charges, or electrons, flow through the wires. Electric current flowing through a filament within the light bulb heats the wire and makes it glow. All common electrical appliances utilize the flow of electrons. Light consists of electromagnetic fields that vibrate or oscillate at right angles to each other. Each form of light emits a unique vibration called an electric field. The combination of these unique fields form what we call light rays. All light rays emit unique waves. The distance between the adjacent wave's crests is called the wavelength. The number of times a wave oscillates each second is called the frequency. Visible light represents only a narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum, which includes many kinds of waves. Gamma rays have an extremely high frequency and short wavelength. Radio waves have a much lower frequency and much longer wavelength. Each color of visible light corresponds to a particular frequency in the spectrum. 
One way scientists measure this frequency is through the use of a spectrometer. Violet light has the shortest wavelength and highest frequency our eyes can detect. Red has the longest wavelength and lowest frequency we can see. Sometimes light behaves more like a particle than a wave, especially when interacting with atoms. An atom absorbs light in a specific amount, or quantum, of energy. Because the interaction involves a discrete amount of energy, we infer that the light is behaving like a particle, or what we call a photon. The excited atom can release its extra energy by emitting it as another photon. By measuring the frequency of photons, scientists can determine which kind of atoms emitted them, and whether they originated on the Earth, the Sun, or in galaxies far away. The front of our eye is covered by a transparent membrane, the cornea. Light passes into the eye through an opening called the pupil. The iris surrounds the pupil, opening or closing in degrees to control the amount of light the eye receives. The sclera is the white outer covering. Movement of the eye is controlled by small muscles attached to it. Light passes through the lens and onto the retina in the back of the eye. The choroid attaches to the back of the retina and provides it with support and blood for nourishment. Light-sensitive cells in the retina produce electrical signals that travel along the optic nerve to the brain. When we look at an object, rays of light coming from the object enter our eye and pass through the lens. The lens bends the light so that rays originating from any one point on the object converge to a single point on the retina. Rays leaving the top of the object end up at the bottom of the retina, producing an inverted image. To focus on nearby objects, the lens must change its shape. It thickens, causing light rays from the object to converge on the retina. To see objects far away, tiny muscles flatten the lens, thereby bringing the image into focus. A fault is a fracture in the Earth's crust, characterized by an uneven crack that may run for many kilometers. The two sides of the fault line are actually two gigantic moving sections, or plates, of the Earth's crust. The crack in the Earth is created because one plate is moving relative to the other. When the plates move past each other, the relative motion is horizontal, and we have a strike-slip fault. The San Andreas Fault, for example, is a strike-slip fault. When the plates press toward each other, large blocks of rock may be lifted up, producing thrust faults. When plates move away from each other, rocks may be lowered, producing downdropped faults. The amount of vertical displacement is called the fault's throw. Faults vary in throw from a few meters to hundreds of meters. Movement of the Earth's great plates is usually slow and steady, causing gradual changes along fault lines. Sometimes, the rock along a fault locks and stress builds up. Earthquakes occur when the rocks break apart and stress is suddenly released. The plates can displace several meters in an instant, creating a violent wrenching of the Earth's crust, toppling man-made structures and triggering landslides and mud flows. Volcanoes are holes or vents in the Earth's crust 
created when molten material or magma under the crust is forced upward through the surface. Magma collects in a chamber beneath the crust. Pressure increases, forcing it up through cracks and fissures, and a conduit to the surface is created. Hot gases try to escape, but are trapped in the magma. The surface begins to bulge. Finally, the pressure can no longer be contained. Gases and fragments of earth are released in a violent explosion. A volcano may erupt many times during its lifetime of thousands of years. Material expelled during the eruptions gradually builds up a cone-shaped mountain. The throat of the volcano is called the central vent. Usually, there is a bowl-shaped crater at the top of the central vent. Volcanic eruptions can be described as explosive or quiet. When the magma is sticky and contains lots of gas, then eruptions tend to be explosive. Hot debris particles, called pyroclastics, are expelled during violent explosions. Heavier pieces land near the crater and serve to build the cone-shaped mountain. Lighter pieces can be carried by the wind for hundreds of miles. When the magma is more fluid and contains less gas, then eruptions are quiet. Molten rock or lava spills out of the volcano and cools on its slopes. Alternating eruptions of pyroclastics and lava build the mountain layer by layer. Friction is the force that slows down or obstructs the motion of one object against another. It is present in almost every activity, from bicycle riding to holding objects to walking and pushing, snowboarding, and more. Scientists believe that friction is caused by bumps and cracks on two surfaces catching on one another, and by bonds that form between atoms and molecules on the objects. When two smooth surfaces make contact, such as a cardboard box on a waxed floor, there is often less friction because there are smaller and fewer bumps on each side. Rougher surfaces, such as sandpaper and unfinished wood, have bigger and more bumps, and therefore create a greater amount of friction. Heavier objects create more friction because they increase the pressure between two surfaces. This increases the number of bumps that come into contact and the number of bonds that form between atoms and molecules. Objects made of or coated with a substance like Teflon form few bonds. They usually cause less friction than objects made of a material that forms many bonds, such as rubber or wood. When two surfaces slide against each other, such as a brake and wheel, they cause sliding friction. Sliding friction resists the movement of an object and makes it slow down, unless another force keeps it moving. When one surface rolls against another, such as a wheel on the ground, it causes rolling friction. Rolling friction resists the motion of the rolling object and slows it down, unless another force keeps it moving. When two surfaces are in contact but not in motion, such as a bicycle's kickstand on the ground, they cause static friction. Static friction makes it difficult to begin moving an object. When motionless, the two surfaces can form more and stronger bonds than if they were moving. So static friction is usually harder to overcome than sliding or rolling friction. In this case, in this case it prevents the kickstand from moving, so the kickstand can support the bicycle. Some objects, such as mountain bike tires, work best when friction is high. 
These tires create a lot of friction by having a sticky and bumpy rubber surface. Other objects, such as bicycle chains, work best when friction is low. Lubricants, such as oil, reduce friction by coating surfaces and keeping them from touching and sticking to each other. Albert Einstein proposed an entirely new way of understanding gravitation based upon similarities between gravity and acceleration. Suppose an astronaut stands inside a space capsule at rest on the Earth. She drops a ball. It accelerates at 9.8 meters per second per second. Now, suppose the capsule is out in deep space, far from any stars or planets. The astronaut and ball are both weightless. Suppose that the rocket engine is fired at just the right amount to cause the capsule to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. The floor of the capsule pushes against the astronaut's feet. To her, it feels the same as if she were standing on the Earth. The ball appears to fall with exactly the same acceleration as it did on the surface of the Earth. Now the astronaut does another experiment with light. If the ship is not accelerating, the light beam follows a straight path. If the ship is accelerating, the path is slightly bent. Einstein reasoned that if light appears to bend in an accelerating frame of reference, then it should bend in a gravitational field. Einstein's prediction was tested during a solar eclipse. One day, the sun and moon moved between two stars. When the sun was directly between the stars and its light was blocked by the moon, the stars appeared to be farther apart. Rays of light from the stars were bent due to the gravitational field of the sun. Einstein's prediction was confirmed. Isaac Newton believed that a single idea could explain why objects fall to the ground and why the moon goes around the earth. The earth exerts a downward force on objects which causes them to speed up or accelerate when they fall. When an object is thrown horizontally, it experiences the same force and accelerates downward at the same rate as when it falls straight down. The faster the object is thrown, the farther it goes before hitting the ground. Newton imagined that if an object were launched with a very high speed, it would curve far around the surface of the Earth. With precisely the right velocity, an object would go into a circular orbit, continually falling toward the center of the Earth, but never getting any closer to the center. Still higher velocities would put the object into an elliptical orbit. Newton realized that the motion of falling objects, projectiles, and celestial bodies could all be understood by a single universal law of gravitation. Scientists today use Newton's law to compute the trajectories of space probes, which must be accurate over millions of miles. If the Earth was not surrounded by a warming blanket of air, it would be much too cold for human habitation. Earth's atmosphere acts as this blanket because it contains small amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other gases in the atmosphere, known as greenhouse gases. These gases help retain heat through a vital process called the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect occurs when sunlight passes through the atmosphere and strikes the Earth. 
some of the light is reflected and some is absorbed. The absorbed light warms the surface of the earth. The heated surface then radiates infrared light into the atmosphere where it is absorbed by greenhouse gases. These gases help regulate the temperature of the earth. Due to the burning of large amounts of coal, oil, and natural gas, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has dramatically increased over the last 300 years. For instance, carbon dioxide, abbreviated as CO2, has increased 30% since 1750. Trees remove CO2 from the air as part of their natural processes. As human beings cut down forests, the capacity of trees to remove CO2 from the air is diminished. Scientists are concerned that as we continue to burn large amounts of fossil fuels and deplete our forests, an exaggerated greenhouse effect will occur, resulting in an increase in the world's surface temperature, known as global warming. A warming of only a few degrees could cause a number of environmental problems, including the melting of the polar ice caps, causing ocean levels to rise and flooding coastal areas. The heart is a muscular organ that pumps blood to all parts of the body. It can be divided into two cavities. Two pumps work simultaneously. The right cavity takes in oxygen-poor blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. The left cavity takes oxygen-rich blood from the lungs and returns it to the body. Each side of the heart has an auricle which draws blood in from the veins, and a ventricle, which pushes the blood out through the arteries. There are two stages in each heartbeat cycle, the systole and the diastole. In diastole, the heart muscle relaxes, and blood is drawn into the two auricles. Rising pressure in each auricle opens the tricuspid and mitral valves, and blood flows into the ventricles. Each auricle contracts, filling ventricles to capacity. During the systole stage, the filled ventricles contract. The mitral and tricuspid valves close. The aortic and pulmonary valves are forced open, and blood pushes out into the arteries. Then the heart relaxes, the aortic and pulmonary valves close, and diastole starts again. When a honeybee finds a new source of nectar, she returns to her hive to communicate the exact location of the nectar to the other bees. Inside the hive, the bee does a circular dance to communicate that the nectar is nearby. Her sister bees smell the nectar on her body and also join in the dance. Then they fly close to the hive until they find the flowers that match the messenger's scent. For nectar sources that are farther away from the hive, the bee does a waggle dance. Inside the hive, the bee dances in a figure eight, waggling her abdomen during the straight run. The dance indicates the precise distance to the nectar. The dance also indicates the compass direction of the nectar relative to the sun. For bees, vertical direction on the honeycomb represents the position of the sun. The angle between the straight run and the vertical equals the angle of the nectar from the sun. Because bees learn so much from the waggle dance, they know exactly where to find the nectar. A 
A wheel and axle is a simple machine that makes moving an object or load easier. It consists of a larger wheel attached to a smaller axle. It acts as a machine only if the wheel and the axle are fixed together and rotate as a single unit. In order to move an object, you must first do some work. The amount of work you do is equal to the force you use, or the effort, times the distance you apply it. A wheel and axle makes things easier by changing the distance you have to turn something. This also changes the amount of force you have to use. In this simple example of a water main, we will ignore the effects of friction. Turning this axle a distance of 10 centimeters will open the valve and release water. Without a wheel, this axle will require a force of 2,000 newtons. Newtons are a way of measuring force. Applying this much force would be very difficult. The work done would be 200 newton meters. With this wheel attached, doing the same amount of work will be easier. By turning the outer edge of the wheel one meter, using 200 newtons of force, you turn the axle 10 centimeters and get the same amount of work done. A wheel and axle makes work easier by spreading out the distance that force is applied. When distance increases, the force decreases, making the job easier. As the diameter of the wheel increases, the amount of force needed is reduced even more. Fertilization is the key to the process of biological development. It occurs when the male sperm cell unites with the female ovum or egg. Hereditary material from two different parent cells combines to form a new individual, similar to the parents, but completely unique. Hundreds of sperm cells approach a single egg. Only one of them attaches, and a change immediately occurs in the egg membrane that keeps others from attaching. The sperm penetrates the membrane, and egg activation occurs. The sperm head disengages from the tail. The egg and sperm nuclei fuse to form one individual nucleus inside a cell called the zygote. The zygote divides into two cells. The two divide into four, the four into eight, and so on, until there is a hollow ball of cells called a morula. The morula enters the uterus, implants itself in the uterine wall, and continues development into an embryo. An incline plane is a simple machine that makes lifting objects easier. In order to lift something, you must do some work. The amount of work you do is equal to the force you use, or the effort of your pull, times the distance you apply it. An incline plane makes things easier by changing the direction and the distance you push or pull. This also changes the amount of force you need to use. Let's see how this works by lifting a suitcase one meter up into a van. The suitcase weighs 120 newtons. Newtons are a way to measure force such as weight. Without the plane, you would need to lift with a force of 120 newtons for one meter. This would take 120 newton meters of work. The inclined plane will make doing the same amount of work easier. Our inclined plane will be a three meter plank leaning against the back of the van. Adding wheels to the suitcase will decrease the friction between it 
and the plank. Friction always makes doing work. Without any friction, you would need to push the suitcase with only 40 newtons of force. But now you have to push for 3 meters instead of just 1. You still did the same amount of work as lifting because you used 40 newtons of force over 3 meters. 40 newtons times 3 meters equals 120 newton meters of work. The incline plane made it easier by changing the angle you push at. Now you don't need to push directly against gravity. You can push with less force than the entire weight of the suitcase. The trade-off is you had to move it over a greater distance. That's how the incline plane works. You trade force for distance while the amount of work stays the same. The longer the plank, the less you lift directly against gravity, but the farther you have to push. In a gasoline engine, a volatile mixture of fuel and air is ignited within a cylinder, causing a sudden expansion of gases. The expanding gases push down on a piston, which turns the crankshaft. A stroke is one movement of the piston, either up or down. Most car engines use a four-stroke cycle. The piston moves four strokes, then repeats the action continuously. During the first stroke, the intake valve opens, the piston moves down, and the fuel and air mixture is drawn into the cylinder. During the compression stroke, the valve closes, the piston moves up, and the mixture is compressed. In the power stroke, the spark plug produces an electric spark, the fuel ignites, and forces the piston down. During the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve opens, the piston rises, and the gases are pushed out of the cylinder. An ordinary light source produces many different wavelengths of light that go off in all directions. A laser is able to generate light waves of a single wavelength, all in step with each other and all traveling in the same direction. This makes laser light pure in color and extremely intense. The first laser was made of a ruby rod, mirrors, and a xenon flash tube. Intense light from the flash tube excites electrons in the ruby's chromium atoms. The electrons are raised to higher energy levels. As random electrons fall back to lower energy levels, particles of light called photons are emitted. When photons from the chromium atoms strike other excited atoms, they cause new photons to be emitted that are identical to the first. The laser light is amplified as photons traveling back and forth between the mirrors intensify the reactions. The light that we use leaves the laser through the partially silvered mirror. The ability of lasers to produce powerful beams of light has made them invaluable in industry, research, and medicine. How does an airplane fly? Physicist Sir Isaac Newton 
stated in his third law of motion that for every action there must be an equal and opposite reaction. In an airplane, the wings push the air downward, and in reaction, the air pushes the wings upward. On an airplane, the wing must be tilted slightly upward. The wings are attached to the fuselage such that their tilt is optimized for cruise conditions. This tilt is called the cruise angle of attack. The angle of attack is the angle the wing has relative to the oncoming airflow. The air smoothly follows the surface of the wing. This is called the Coanda effect. Due to the Coanda effect, air flowing past the top of the wing is pushed downward as it follows the wing's curve, creating lift. Lift is also created when air flowing past the bottom of the wing strikes the wing and is pushed downward. As the wing moves through the air, it pushes a mass of air downward by providing a downward force. Following Newton's third law, the equal and opposite upward force is the lift that keeps the airplane in the air. A steeper angle of attack genft until the flow of air is disrupted and the wing stalls, losing its lift. In meiosis, one chromosome division and two cell division stages occur, resulting in four sex cells from one parent cell, each with half the number of chromosomes. The chromosomes become more distinct and appear as single threads. Each thread, however, has actually become a double strand of two identical chromatids. The centrioles replicate and move apart. The nuclear membrane becomes less distinct and spindle fibers form between centrioles. Pairs of chromosomes align along the middle of the cell. Each pair consists of two chromatids attached at the center. The pairs pull apart and move along spindle fibers toward the two centrioles. The cell membrane pinches inward. The membrane forms around the new nuclei and two new cells are created. The new cells contain half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell, but each is double-stranded. The centrioles replicate and move apart. The chromatid pairs align at the center. During the second division, chromatid pairs split at the center and move to opposite centrioles along spindle fibers. The cell membranes pinch inward and spindle fibers begin to break up. The cell completes its division. Chromosomes become less and less distinct and the nuclei form. At the end of meiosis, four new cells have been formed, each with half the number of parent chromosomes and each with a different combination of genetic information. In the mid-1800s, Austrian monk Gregor Mendel formulated some of the underlying principles of genetics through his observations of pea plants. Mendel noted that the plants were either tall or short. He created purebred strains by breeding tall plants together and short plants together. Mendel then crossed a tall plant with a short plant. Surprisingly, all of the offspring were tall. Mendel then tried crossing two of these tall offspring. The offspring from this crossing turned out to be in a ratio of three tall plants to one short plant. By looking at the underlying genetics, we can understand what Mendel observed. Information about traits is carried on genes. We can represent the gene for height with the letter T. Each plant has two genes for height, one from each parent. 
Different forms of the same gene are called alleles. The big T represents the allele for tall, and the little t represents the allele for short. In purebred plants, both alleles carry the same information, and the plants are said to be homozygous. When tall purebred plants are crossed with short purebred plants, their offspring each receive one allele for tall and one for short. The offspring are called heterozygous. Since these plants all appear tall, we say that tall is the dominant trait and short is the recessive trait. When these heterozygous plants are crossed, three-fourths of the offspring carry the dominant trait and appear tall. The recessive trait appears in the remaining one-quarter of the offspring, who receive two alleles for short. This type of simple inheritance is one of the many ways that traits are passed from parents to their offspring. When a body cell divides, each new daughter cell must carry with it identical genetic information. A cell does this through a process called mitosis. The membrane surrounding the nucleus becomes less distinct, and the chromosomes become more distinct. Now we see there are pairs of chromosomes attached to each other at the center. Spindle fibers radiate and begin to form between the centrioles. The centrioles stop at opposite poles of the cell. The two identical parts of each double chromosome are called chromatids. Chromatids separate and move apart along the spindle fibers toward each pole. The cell begins to pinch inward. With the chromosomes now at either pole, the spindles break up. The cell membrane divides and the nuclei form. Chromosomes become less and less distinct. When division is complete, there are two new cells genetically similar to the original. Muscles make up about 35% of a human's body weight. Muscles are made up of long, thin fiber bundles held together with connective tissue. Each fiber has a number of nuclei and contains tiny protein threads called myofibrils. Myofibrils give muscle its striated appearance. Myofibrils are divided into segments called sarcomeres. The sarcomere is the functional unit of contraction. Sarcomeres contain parallel thick and thin protein filaments, actin and myosin. Between the sarcomeres are thin partitions known as Z-bands. Muscle contraction is explained by the sliding filament theory. A contraction begins when a nerve impulse reaches a muscle. When the muscle is stimulated, myosin crossbridges bend and attach to sites on the actin filaments. The crossbridges then straighten, causing the actin filaments to slide along the myosin. Since the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-band, this causes each sarcomere to shorten and the whole myofibril contracts. When the myofibrils contract, the muscle fiber shortens. When enough fibers shorten, the entire muscle 
contracts. Nuclear fission is the process in which atoms of certain elements split, producing heat. A commonly used element is uranium-235. The nucleus of the uranium-235 atom contains 235 particles called protons and neutrons. In naturally occurring samples of uranium, where the concentration of nuclei is low, free neutrons move about passing through or colliding with the nuclei without effect. Occasionally, a neutron causes a nucleus to split or fission into two parts. This event releases energy and produces two or three new free neutrons. However, the free neutrons are quickly lost, so no sustained reaction occurs. In a nuclear reactor, the uranium-235 fuel has been enriched to increase the concentration of fissionable nuclei. Three neutrons released after the fission of one nucleus have a higher probability of hitting other uranium-235 nuclei and causing them to fission. When, on average, each fission results in one new fission, a sustained nuclear reaction occurs. In a reactor, the rate of reaction is controlled and the heat produced is used to generate electrical power. When on average more than one new fission is initiated for each fission that occurs, then an uncontrolled chain reaction results. A free-running nuclear chain reaction can release an enormous amount of energy in a tiny fraction of a second. A nuclear reactor produces heat through nuclear fission in which atomic nuclei break apart, releasing large amounts of energy. In the core of the reactor, a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction takes place. Control rods are raised or lowered to absorb neutrons and control the reaction and the amount of heat produced. The most common type of nuclear reactor is the pressurized water reactor. It is known as a double loop system because it uses two circuits of water. The first circuit, or primary loop, pumps water heated by the reactor core through coils in a heat exchanger. In the secondary loop, water, converted to steam in the heat exchanger, is fed under pressure to turn turbine generators. The steam is cooled by water drawn from a large reservoir, such as a river or ocean. It condenses to water and is pumped back to the heat exchanger, completing the loop. Finally, generators produce electricity, which is delivered to a power grid by transmission lines. Most of us don't think about how our everyday activities might influence the global environment. An example is our use of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. These compounds are useful as refrigerants, solvents, and aerosol propellants. When released into the air, these chemicals disperse throughout the atmosphere. In the upper atmosphere, there is a layer containing a small amount of ozone. The ozone layer is important to living things because it blocks harmful ultraviolet rays from reaching the surface. A few years ago, scientists discovered that CFCs, even in very small amounts, cause ozone to break down. 
When CFCs reach the upper atmosphere and are exposed to ultraviolet light, they release a highly reactive chlorine gas. The chlorine acts as a catalyst. It breaks down ozone molecules, but it isn't changed itself. A single molecule of chlorine can destroy thousands of ozone molecules. A severe depletion of the ozone layer would result in an increase in cases of skin cancer, eye cataracts, and suppression of the immune system in humans and other species. Food crops sensitive to ultraviolet rays could also be affected. In 1984, a hole in the ozone layer was discovered over Antarctica. More recently, a similar hole has been discovered that extends over the Arctic, Scandinavia, and North America. We can help protect the ozone layer by being careful about what chemicals we release into the air. If you watch the moon over the course of several days, you will see that its appearance changes. The varying appearances, called phases, depend upon the relative positions of the sun and moon. At different times of the month, the sun illuminates different parts of the moon. When the moon is between the sun and the earth, we cannot see any of the illuminated side of the moon. The moon is dark. We call this phase the new moon. The amount of lighted surface visible from the earth begins to grow we see a waxing crescent. When the moon reaches first quarter, we see half of it lit. As the illuminated portion grows, we have a waxing gibbous moon. A full moon occurs when the moon reaches the side of the earth opposite from the sun. Gradually, less and less of the bright side of the moon is visible. This is the waning gibbous phase. Three quarters of the way through the moon's cycle, we have the last quarter phase, when half of the moon is lit. As a waning crescent, the moon diminishes to a thin sliver returning to a new moon after 29 and a half days, or one lunar month. As the moon revolves around the Earth, it rotates on its own axis at the same rate it revolves. Therefore, the moon always keeps the same face toward the Earth. Green plants make food through a process called photosynthesis. Using energy from the sun, cells in the leaves turn simple materials into energy-rich food. The epidermis is the skin. Beneath the upper epidermis lie the palisade cells, which are the chief food producers. Spongy cells are partly surrounded with pockets of air, which enable the cells to exchange gases with the atmosphere. The stomata are small openings in the lower epidermis, under the leaf. Leaf veins carry water and nutrients from the roots. Carbon dioxide enters through the stomata. Chlorophyll, contained in cells of the palisade and spongy layers, helps absorb sunlight and transform light energy into chemical energy. Carbon dioxide combines with water and is photosynthesized into oxygen and sugar. Oxygen escapes through the stomata. The sugar, dissolved in water, is carried throughout the plant, providing energy for growth. The Earth's continents and oceans rest upon a layer of rock called the lithosphere. 
The lithosphere consists of roughly a dozen separate rock masses or plates. Plate tectonics is the theory that describes the motion of these plates. Beneath the lithosphere is the asthenosphere, a plastic layer of material that flows very slowly as it is heated from the mantle below. Some regions in the Earth's mantle are hotter than others. It rises. Upon reaching the top of the asthenosphere, the material spreads out. Plates of the lithosphere, riding on top of the moving material, move apart. If the heating occurs beneath an ocean, the Earth's crust is lifted up and forms an oceanic ridge. The ocean widens as new seafloor is produced. Material in the asthenosphere eventually cools, becoming more dense. It then sinks, carrying parts of the lithosphere with it. This process is known as subduction. As oceanic crust dives beneath continents, it melts, forming liquid rock or magma. Sometimes this magma seeps to the surface and bursts out, forming volcanoes. Most volcanoes of the world lie along zones in which ocean plates plunge beneath continental plates. Plates in the Earth's crust move only a few centimeters a year. However, over the course of millions of years, the face of the Earth is transformed. The human nervous system is a vast communications network. Billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain communicate with billions of other neurons throughout the body. An electric signal or impulse is received by a neuron's dendrites and travels along the axon, a thin tube up to three feet long. When the neuron is at rest, the axon maintains a chemical balance in the neuron by keeping more potassium ions inside the cell and more sodium ions outside. When an electric impulse is transmitted, the membrane surrounding the axon is stimulated at the node of Ranvier to permit the different ions to leak through the axon membrane. Potassium and sodium ions change places, which creates an electric impulse that travels along the axon membrane. The space between two neurons is called a synapse. When the electric impulse reaches a synapse, structures called synaptic vesicles discharge neurotransmitters. These chemicals ferry the electric impulse to the next neuron. The first neuron returns to a resting state. Potassium and sodium ions begin to change places in the second neuron, and the electric impulse passes on to the next neuron. Quantum theory describes the behavior of light and matter on an atomic scale. We usually think of light as a wave and electrons as particles. Electrons within a TV set can be described as particles. In other situations, electrons are better described as waves. Suppose we do an experiment using marbles to represent particles. They roll through open door A and are counted. The graph shows the greatest concentration of marbles near door A. A similar graph is produced when the marbles roll through door B. If both doors are open, we might expect the graph to look like the sum of the two previous graphs. Let's do the experiment. The results match our prediction. 
To compare particle and wave behavior, we replace the marbles with water and the counters with detectors for wave intensity. With a single door open, the results for waves look the same as for particles. What happens when both doors are open? We get an entirely different graph. The waves passing through the two doors interfere with each other, heightening the wave in some places and canceling it in others. A maximum occurs along the midline between the two doors. Imagine that we do this experiment with electrons. A hot wire emits electrons, and they are counted by detectors at the far end of the apparatus. We adjust the source of electrons so that on average there is only one electron in the apparatus at any given time. When only one door is open, results are similar to both particles and waves. What kind of graph would you expect to see when both doors are open? Remember, only one electron is traveling from source to detector at any one time. If you predicted that the graph would look like the graph for particles, you would be in good company. Most scientists would have said the same thing prior to the advent of quantum theory. In actuality, the electrons do interfere with each other, behaving like waves. But how can the electrons interfere with one another when they pass through the apparatus one at a time? This is the question that makes quantum theory non-intuitive. It may not seem possible, but this is the way nature works. The modern mechanical refrigerator works on the principle that a liquid absorbs heat when it turns to a gas. The gas carries away heat during evaporation, leaving a cooled liquid behind. Since heat flows from warmer bodies to colder bodies, a vaporizing liquid cools objects that are in contact with it. Pressurized liquid refrigerant leaves a storage container under high pressure. It flows through a metering device containing a length of narrow tubing where the pressure drops and the liquid vaporizes into gas. As the gas enters the evaporator, it has a lower temperature than it did as a liquid. As the refrigerant passes through the coils of the evaporator, it absorbs heat and cools the inside of the cabinet. The low pressure refrigerant vapor is pumped into the compressor. The compressed vapor, now at an elevated temperature, flows at high pressure into the condenser. Here it is air-cooled. As heat is transferred out of the refrigerant into the air, the gas returns to a liquid state. Warm air is expelled by the refrigerator. The refrigerant is collected in the storage tank, ready to begin another cycle of refrigeration. A thermostat, connected to a temperature sensor on the cabinet, controls the compressor and maintains a constant temperature inside the refrigerator. A rocket is propelled by rapidly expanding gases that are produced when fuel is burned in a combustion chamber. In a liquid fuel rocket, Fuel and oxidizer are stored as liquids in separate tanks. Pipes carry the liquids to pumps that force the propellants into the combustion chamber. Valves control the rate of flow of the propellants. The oxidizer mixes with the fuel, providing the oxygen necessary for it to burn, and large quantities of expanding gases are produced. Hot gas pushes against the walls of the combustion chamber. The force exerted by the gas against one side of the chamber is balanced by the force exerted on the opposite side, so there is no sideways force. However, gas pressure against the top of the chamber results in an unbalanced force.
because there is no wall at the nozzle to push against. The net force of the gas is therefore upward on the chamber, and the rocket is propelled. The solar system is home to the Sun, nine planets and their moons, asteroids, comets, and interplanetary dust and gas. The planets orbit the Sun and tilt toward or away from it at different angles. They all rotate in place as well. At the center of the solar system is the largest body, the Sun. It's one of over 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Its gravitational pull holds the planets in orbit and its radiation affects everything in the solar system. Mercury is the planet closest to the Sun. With a surface similar to Earth's moon, it's heavily cratered. It's also very hot due to the proximity to the Sun. Venus is full of volcanoes and has an atmosphere so heavy it keeps the surface hot enough to melt lead. Earth is the third planet from the Sun. It's the only planet with known life. It has more water on its surface than land. And it has one moon. Mars, the red planet, is full of vast plains and is home to Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. An asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter forms the boundary between the inner and outer solar system. Jupiter is more than twice as massive as all the other planets combined and is mostly gas. Saturn is also gaseous and has spectacular rings. It has at least 18 moons. Uranus has more subtle rings. Its axis is different from the other planets in that it appears to be lying on its side. Neptune has faint rings, as well as the fastest winds in the solar system, reaching speeds up to 2,000 kilometers per hour. The Kuiper Belt is a disk-shaped region past Neptune that contains many small comets. Pluto is by far the smallest planet. Its orbit is so elliptical that it's sometimes closer to the Sun than Neptune is. The Oort Cloud contains many comets that take a long period of time to orbit the Sun. The Sun's influence ends at a place astronomers call the heliopause. The solar system is huge. To show its scale, imagine the Sun as a soccer ball, Earth as a kernel of popcorn, and Pluto as the tiny head of a pin. On this scale, Earth would orbit about 22 meters away from the Sun. but tiny little Pluto would orbit 863 meters out, over eight soccer fields away.
One of the surprising results of the special theory of relativity is that moving clocks run slowly. Einstein made this prediction after thinking about what would happen if the speed of light were measured by moving observers. An object's velocity must be specified relative to a particular frame of reference. In the astronaut's frame of reference, the blue ship is moving toward the left at 100 meters per second, while the red is going to the right at 75. What is the velocity of the blue ship relative to the red? Measured by an observer in the red ship, blue is going 175 meters per second. What happens if we measure the speed of light from different frames of reference? The astronaut measures the speed of light to be 300,000 kilometers per second. Suppose the red ship is traveling at 240,000 kilometers per second, or about 80% the speed of light. What speed would be measured by the pilot of the red ship? Before Einstein, most people would have said 540,000 kilometers per second. However, this is not what is actually observed. An observer in the red ship obtains exactly the same result as the astronaut, namely 300,000 kilometers per second, or 0.3 meters per nanosecond. A consequence of this result is that there must be no such thing as absolute time either. Inside the red ship, we have a clock that uses light to keep time. A pulse of light strikes a mirror and returns to its source. The light travels 0.6 meters in 2 nanoseconds. In the astronaut's frame of reference, the pulse travels a total distance of one meter along a diagonal path. The astronaut observes the light traveling the same speed as always, 0.3 meters per nanosecond. According to his watch, the pulse takes 3.3 nanoseconds to make the trip. The astronaut concludes correctly that the clock on the moving ship runs slowly. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is the fundamental building block of all living things. DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell and determines its form and function. It also passes genetic information from one generation to the next by making exact duplicates of itself. The DNA molecule is in the shape of a double helix resembling a twisted rope ladder. The sides are made up of alternating sections of phosphate and a sugar called deoxyribose. The rungs carry the genetic information and consist of four bases, thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. A nucleotide is a subunit of the latter, which contains one phosphate, one base, and one sugar. A nucleotide is a subunit of the latter, which contains one phosphate, one base, and one sugar. It is the sequence of nucleotides which determines the unique genetic code for each individual. We can see how the molecule operates by viewing it during replication, just before the cell divides. The nucleotide pairs pull apart, starting at one end, separating the latter between the bases. Free-floating nucleotides pair up with bases of each latter half, an adenine only combining with a thymine, a guanine only with a cytosine. When the original latter halves finish the process of splitting and recombining, two identical DNA strands result, and cell division can take place.
What happens when you make a phone call? Start by lifting the handset from the cradle. The switch rises and the telephone is connected to the routing network. This is confirmed by the sound of a dial tone. A number is dialed and transmitted. Hello? Hello? Is Grandpa there? An electric mouthpiece acts as a microphone. Sound waves from your voice make a plastic disc vibrate, changing the distance between it and a metal disc. This changes the intensity of an electric field between the discs. The changing field causes a varying electric current to travel down the phone line to the receiver of another phone, where the current is changed back into your voice. The receiver is a loudspeaker that converts the electronic signal to sound by passing the current through a pair of electromagnets. The magnets vibrate a metal diaphragm that reproduces your voice. What happens next depends on the kind of call you make. Which kind would you like to make? When you make a local call, the call goes to a computer-controlled routing station, where it is automatically sent to the local number being dialed. Hello? When you call a cellular phone, the call goes from a routing station to an antenna, which uses radio signals to communicate with the cellular phone. Each antenna serves a small area, called a cell, and together the cells resemble a honeycomb. Hello? When you make a long-distance call, the call goes from a routing station to a long-distance station. If the call is international, it can be connected by a satellite from one routing station to another. Or the signal is sent over a huge cable network that runs along the bottom of the ocean, connecting the continents to one another. Hello? Ninety-eight percent of American homes have at least one of them, and almost everyone watches it. The forecast mostly sunny sky. But how exactly does a television set work? A video camera captures light reflected off an image and turns it into an electric signal called the video signal. This is done by a charged coupled device, or CCD, located inside the camera. In the CCD, the light from a scene strikes a group of photodiodes arranged on a silicon chip. Photodiodes conduct electricity when they are struck by light. The CCD converts the incoming light from the scene into an electrical video signal. At the same time, a microphone picks up sound vibrations and turns them into an electrical signal as well. The audio and video signals are then combined and sent out from a studio to a receiving station, which sends them to your house through an antenna, satellite, or cable, where your television set turns it back into moving images with synchronized sound. The audio signal goes to an amplifier and speaker, while the video signal goes to a tuner and the picture tube. The television picture tube receives video signals from the tuner and translates them back into images. The images are created by an electron gun in the back of the picture tube, which shoots a beam of electrons through a shadow mask onto the screen. The screen is coated with clusters of red, blue, and green phosphor dots, which glow when they are struck by the electron beams. A shadow mask keeps each beam in line with its own color dots. The continuing changing of red, blue, and green phosphor dots gives the illusion of a moving color picture. Currently, 47 degrees. A tornado is a violent, twisting, funnel-shaped windstorm. Its name comes from the Latin word tonare which means to thunder. Tornadoes form out of the bottom of cumulonimbus clouds, where cold, dry air meets warm, moist air. They are always associated with severe thunderstorms. Scientists aren't exactly sure how tornadoes form, 
but think they usually begin when an updraft of warm, moist air rises rapidly through cold air near the top of the cloud. As this happens, more warm air rushes in to replace it, and colder air is forced downward. The interaction of warm and cold air causes the updraft to rotate, forming a vacuum cleaner-like funnel which sucks air and objects up into it. Tornadoes are made visible by dust they suck up, as well as condensed water droplets in the center of the cloud. They rotate primarily counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Size can vary from a few meters to about a kilometer wide where the funnel touches the ground. The average width is a few hundred meters. Tornadoes can travel over distances ranging from short hops to many kilometers. They produce the most powerful winds on Earth, with some reaching speeds up to 800 kilometers per hour. Damage results from both the high winds and the extremely low pressure in the center of the funnel. Tornadoes damage structures by tearing off roofs, collapsing buildings, and hurling objects with great force. A tornado dies when the cold downdraft wraps around it, weakening and eliminating the updraft. A turbofan engine combines the power of a jet engine with the efficiency and economy of a propeller engine. A fan draws air into the engine. Some of it is taken into the core, where it is pressurized by blades in the compressor. Fuel is pumped through the fuel injectors and mixed with air in the combustion chambers. The volatile mixture ignites, producing rapidly expanding exhaust gases. Part of the thrust of the turbofan engine comes from the pressure of the exhaust gas against the front wall of the combustion chamber. The bulk of the thrust comes from the action of the outside air on the fan blades. Exhaust gases from the combustion chamber pass through a turbine which drives the fan and compressor. Most of the air drawn in by the fan bypasses the engine. This compressed air pushes forward on the blades of the fan. In this way, the fan acts as a propeller, providing forward thrust. The Wankel engine is named after its inventor, Dr. Felix Wankel. It's also called a rotary combustion engine. Wankel engines have been used to power motorcycles, snowmobiles, aircraft, and the Mazda RX-7 sports car. A Wankel-powered Mazda won the French Le Mans endurance race in 1991. While most engines use several cylinders and pistons to produce power, a Wankel engine uses a single oval-shaped housing with a triangular rotor inside. The rotor creates three chambers, sealed by the rotor tips moving against the housing wall. Fuel and air enter the housing through an intake port. A spark plug is used to ignite a fuel-air mixture. And exhaust gases exit through the exhaust port. The engine transmits power from the combustion directly from a ringed gear in the middle of the rotor to a centered drive shaft. The ringed gear and drive shaft let the rotor tips follow the shape of the housing. Let's see how these parts work together during the stages of a four-stroke combustion cycle. The first stage of the cycle is the intake. It starts as the rotor face moves past the intake port, sucking in a mixture of fuel and air from a carburetor. As the rotor continues to turn, 
the fuel and air mixture is compressed by the rotor against the housing wall. As the rotor face reaches the spark plug, the plug fires, igniting the fuel. The explosion of expanding gases pushes the rotor and the force is transmitted through the ring gear to the drive shaft. The rotor continues to turn until the tip of the rotor passes the exhaust port. The rotor then pushes the exhaust gases out of the housing through the port and begins another cycle. Compared to piston engines, Wankel engines have fewer parts, supply more power for their weight, and run smoother with less vibration. Their chief disadvantages are poorer fuel economy and wear on the rotor tips.